I returned home from work with an unpleasant feeling in my stomach. I didn't know why, but I had a feeling I would soon find out. It was only five o'clock on Friday evening. This is unusual for me as I work for myself and like to spend time alone in the office on a Friday night to make sure everything is in order and ready for the big day on Saturday. My name is Mark Ashworth and my business is Ashworth Autos. I started my working life at the age of 16 as a car mechanic. At 20, he opened his own auto repair shop, specializing in expensive European cars. There are a lot of them in our area, but the only mechanic is 150 miles away. Yes, it was expensive, but I had a friendly bank manager who understood my business plan, and I was a very talented mechanic. Plus, I had a deposit left to me by my grandfather. All European cars are driven exclusively by wealthy people. They come to me because I have a good reputation. Soon they began asking me to find cars, usually used ones, for their sons and daughters when they started driving. I quickly added a used car business to my auto repair shop and then an auto body repair shop. Now I am 38 years old. I have four locations in the area, and I own a business, according to the most conservative estimates, worth $8 million. I returned home early because my wife, Hannah, said that I needed to be home early today. She has an important proposal, and she wants to talk to me about it. Hannah is 35 years old and we have been married for 14. We met because her father, John, asked me to find her a car for her 20th birthday. A spark immediately jumped between us. That day when she was picking up the car, she asked me out on a date. A year later, we got married and now have two boys, James, 12, and Martin, 10. Hannah's father, John, is an accountant, but a very nice man. He is a partner in an accounting office and helps me a lot in business, devoting a lot of time to me. Hannah's mom, Stephanie, calls me a fat monkey and makes it clear that she thinks her daughter could aspire to more than me. Hannah has an older brother, Alex, and a younger sister, Susan. Alex never got married, and it is clear that he has no intention of doing so. Susan is married to a lawyer named Barkley. He fancies himself a shark, but he actually makes his living as a trial lawyer. Hannah's mother considers him the best son-in-law in the world. Something happened to Susan in her early teens. I never found out what it was, but she had to have an operation that left her unable to have children. As a result, our two boys were our only grandchildren. Stephanie seems to be annoyed by this, but Susan has become depressed because her mother only talks about the children. Hannah is worried about her sister. At one family meeting, I suggested they adopt a child, but Stephanie exploded saying that she wanted the grandchildren to be biologically hers. John's next proposal was surrogacy. Susan asked how this could be done, and I explained as best I could about IVF. Stephanie wrinkled her nose again, saying it was too complicated, and asked who would be the egg donor. Later that evening, Hannah and I discussed Susan's problem. I suggested that she donate her eggs for IVF, Hannah asked it how this would happen, and I replied that I would look into the matter. It turned out that retrieving eggs was not that difficult, and I brought this information home. This way, Stephanie can have her biological children and all will be well in the world. This conversation took place about three months ago, and since then this topic has come up randomly, about every two to three weeks. The reason I have a sinking feeling in my stomach is because Hannah has been a little out of it for the last week or 10 days. I couldn't understand what was going on, but she was corresponding with someone. She's usually completely open with her phone, but in this case, she was secretive. Besides, we haven't had sex for over a week. She gave me pleasure below the belt, but there was no sex. This is very unusual for Hannah. Our house stands on a plot of just over one and a half hectares. I inherited the land from my grandfather when I was 11 years old. I built a house on it soon after we got married. My plot is part of a six-hectare property that my grandfather ran as a gardening business. He left the house and almost half a hectare to my older brother. The remaining four hectares were sold for housing development, and the proceeds were transferred to a trust fund for the benefit of the whole family, including the education of our children. The house is not visible from the road, so when I turned towards it, I saw only a few parked cars. 
and I realized that my bad feelings were justified when I saw John and Stephanie's car, Susan and Barkley's car, and several other people whom I knew to be more distant relatives. I felt like a whole storm was approaching me, and they were going to pretend that it was a light breeze. I parked at the house and went inside, bracing myself for the coming storm. I deliberately entered through the garage door, knowing that they would not hear me. I stood in the utility room and listened, but only muffled voices reached me. I always carry a voice recorder in my pocket. John taught me this as I walked into a meeting to take notes at the end. Out of habit, I turned on the recorder and put it back in my pocket, confident that it would capture most of the conversation that I realized was about to take place. Taking a deep breath, I pushed the door open and entered the kitchen. Eight people were sitting in a corner next to the kitchen. Hannah, John, and Stephanie sat on the three-seater sofa. Susan and Barkley are on a double, Alex is on a single, and Joan and Karen, the two aunts, are on chairs brought from the dining room. The only thing left empty was the chair that had been moved from my home office. It was positioned so that it was surrounded by Alex and the two aunties and was directly across from Hannah, John, and Stephanie. Clearly a prepared ambush. As I closed the door behind me, Hannah said, Come in, Mark, and sit down. We're just discussing a couple of things and would like to hear your opinion. I thought, we'd like to hear your opinion, so now they'll offer me something, and I'm expected to have no choice. I went to the corner but turned one of the stools from the bar counter and sat on it. I wanted the atmosphere in the room to change, and sitting on a high stool, I not only separated from everyone else but also became taller. That is, they would have to look up to me. I was silent, but looked Hannah straight in the eyes, and my face showed great irritation. She blushed when she realized what I was doing, but she couldn't hold my gaze. I slowly looked around the room. John and Alex didn't look at me. Stephanie had an expression of triumph on her face, as if she was about to achieve her cherished goal. Barclay looked into my eyes and grinned, as if he was going to get the better of me and Susan's face appeared with a smile that had not been there for a long time. Hannah sat silently, waiting for me to speak, but I didn't do this. Looking around the room, I continued to look at her, and she tried her best to avoid my gaze. I thought, I can wait as long as you, and was silent. It turned into a battle, and she started to get angry with me. Finally, Stephanie broke the silence by saying, We discussed Susan's problem, and it seems we found a solution. I didn't answer Stephanie and continued to look at Hannah, who was now fidgeting under my gaze. Finally, Hannah looked up at me. Mark, as you know, Susan cannot have children, and you have explored the possibility of surrogacy, and we believe that this is a good option. Mom wants the eggs to biologically belong to the family, so over the past few weeks we have been discussing the option of me being the surrogate mother. I raised my hand to stop her. Have you discussed this over the past few weeks? And why did they consider it necessary to exclude me from these discussions? Obviously, this decision will have a major impact on the boys and I, and I think we should have been aware of all of this. Stephanie chimed in. What do you mean? This has nothing to do with you. Just hold her hand and smile. I took a deep breath and turned to Stephanie, keeping my eyes on Hannah. Naturally, this will affect me and the boys. Their mother will be in an IVF clinic and then carry the baby, which means she won't be able to do certain things for them, like carry them into their crib. Both of her previous pregnancies were difficult, and both times she was hospitalized for a month with high blood pressure. She will have to undergo tests and spend time in the hospital during the birth, which will remove her from their lives. She will also need time to recover. It would take a certain degree of selfishness, not to realize how devastating this would be for my family. What worried me the most was when, as I said, IVF clinic, Hannah's gaze slid around the room. Barclay's face grinned, and Susan flinched. What am I missing? Stephanie obviously enjoyed bringing me up to speed. There will be no IVF clinic. My grandson will be conceived in love and passion, not in a test tube. The light bulb went on, this is an ambush, and the others are here to keep me under control. I felt anger flare on my face and shouted, Hannah, explain everything now. 
She glanced at me and I saw fear in her eyes. The conversation had not gone as she had planned and now the truth was out and she had lost control of the conversation. She said, IVF is not the best option. Two months ago, I stopped taking the pills. My period came three weeks ago and will come in another week. Doctors say that in about two to three weeks, I will become fertile. During my fertility period, Barkley will move in with me for a week and by the end of the week, I should be pregnant. And then Susan and Barksley will be able to adopt a child who will be biologically related to both of them. By this time, I was standing right in front of Hannah and felt Alex's hand on my shoulder. I tried to pull away, but he held my shoulder very tightly. I heard him say, Hang in there, Mark. Please don't do anything stupid. I stood up straight and, without addressing anyone, said, Don't do anything stupid. Nothing will be stupid after this shit. Now I turned to everyone and said, Get out of my house! Stephanie tried to insist. No, we must agree and decide whether you will stay in the house when this happens. John was already up and trying to get his wife out of her seat when I said, John, I've never hit a woman before, but if your stupid wife isn't out of this house in ten seconds, God knows I'll hit her. At that moment, Stephanie looked into my eyes and for the first time realized the truth of my words. She jumped up and asked, Hannah, don't you need Alex to stay behind for protection? I laughed. If you think I would physically harm my wife, you don't know me. If you think that this nonsense will end well for our marriage, then you really don't know me at all. Hannah gasped and then said, Mom, please go away. Everyone else leaves. Mark and I have a lot to discuss. When everyone left the house, I went into my office, locking the door. First of all, I downloaded the conversation that had just taken place, then rebooted the recorder. When he did this, Hannah screamed, Mark, I have never seen you behave so rudely with anyone. You need to come out here and discuss everything like an adult. Good God, she's throwing all this crap at me and she's angry that I'm angry, I thought to myself. I laughed, but remained silent. At work, I have a system for recording all phone calls, SMS, and WhatsApp messages. They are recorded as part of our CRM system and have saved us on more than one occasion when we were billing for extra work. Hannah's phone was a business phone, so all her messages were recorded, although they were saved in the junk folder. I quickly accessed her records and downloaded all the voice calls and messages between her mom, Susan, and Barkley. In fact, everything turned out to be simple. They created a WhatsApp group called Baby. It included Hannah, Susan, Barkley, and Stephanie. Taking my time, I looked through the messages in the group. The discussion started three months ago, right after the day surrogacy was mentioned. It all started with Hannah offering to donate eggs for a surrogate mother and then escalated into her becoming a surrogate mother herself. Stephanie played a key role in how the conception would take place, and Barkley readily made suggestions. Stephanie only said that the child should be conceived in passion. She had some irrational belief that a child conceived in a test tube would not have sufficient emotional maturity. It took me about an hour to collect my thoughts. I also took this opportunity to contact my lawyer and ask him for a referral to a divorce lawyer. Leaving the office, I found Hannah sitting in the corner drinking a glass of wine. The first outburst of anger passed, but there was still rage written on her face. I looked at her. Did you really think that I would swallow this sudden nonsense? Her anger flared again as she replied, what do you mean nonsense? We agreed on how to help my sister get out of depression, and you act like a spoiled child, literally throwing my family out of my own home. I just laughed. You want to commit adultery under the guise of allegedly providing your sister with a child, and you are angry with me for refusing you. Hannah, go and think about what you propose, and remember that this is also my home, and anyone who disrespects me in it will suffer the full wrath of me. I want you to be clear that this will not happen. If you continue like this, it will lead to our divorce. Do you need me to paint a full picture for you to understand? So where are the kids? I hope you at least used some common sense and didn't get them into this mess. The word divorce took the wind out of her sails, but she recovered and said, If you divorce me, I'll leave you with no pants, paying child and spousal support. I will also receive half of the business, which I will sell to anyone who buys it. 
I started laughing again. She really was noticeably stupid and answered, I hope you haven't listened to enough of Barclay's advice. Not only is this advice bad, but this advice will lead to me taking away his license as the beneficiary of your actions. But let me explain that not only this house, but also the land on which it stands was given to me before we got married. This is not marital property. We both signed a marital contract. You have no claims to my business, and I have no claims to the business that you and your father run together. If you are planning to become pregnant, especially by a man other than your husband, your medical history will show that you will not be able to care for children. Don't forget that during both pregnancies you were hospitalized for blood pressure problems. So, I agree to guardianship. Hannah, if you want a dirty fight, I'll give it to you. You won't get Barkley pregnant if you plan to stay married to me. And I won't agree to IVF because I don't trust you anymore. You have set things up in such a way that you either win or lose. And winning is our mariage. Now where are the children? I want to see them. She realized that I had stopped the discussion and she would have to retreat. She said, they're at the Patterson's house number 30. I'm going after them now. Please prepare dinner. I left a couple of pizzas in the refrigerator. I heated up the pizza, then played with the boys in the garden until it was time for bed. I knew I needed to talk to Hannah, but I just couldn't bear to have the conversation. Both boys went to bed at 9.30 in the evening, as I had exhausted them and myself playing football in the garden. Finally, I got to the point where I couldn't hold it in any longer. I went to the refrigerator for a beer and went to the corner where Hannah was sitting on the only chair. He sat down opposite her on the three-seater sofa, took a long sip of beer, and said, Did you really believe that I would agree for you to cheat on me and give birth to a child for Susan? Not only that, but you expected me to vacate my own bed. I don't think you understand the disrespect and humiliation you were about to inflict on me. I noticed the sad look on Hannah's face when she said, I have to do something for Susan. My sister is completely depressed. My mother hates IVF and Barclay says they can't afford it anyway. If you don't allow it, I'm afraid Susan will hurt herself, and I'll never forgive myself if she does. So, this is a big performance, essentially blackmail. I poured myself another drink and replied, There's no way you and Barclay will be able to arrange sex to get pregnant. If they can't afford IVF, we'll give them the money, or we can go 50-50 with your parents. If your mom doesn't like it, then that's her problem. To be completely clear, I have already asked the company lawyer for a referral to a divorce lawyer. I'm serious. Do this, and we'll break up. And don't put the costs on me. I won't stay married to a cheater. And if you do this, you will become her. She ran out of the room crying, and I heard the bedroom door slam shut. I don't know if she locked it, but I decided that I wouldn't sleep next to her that night. The thought that she might try to convince me through sex was disgusting, and I wanted her to know what it would be like for her without me. I went into the office, locked at the door again, and looked through her message log again. It turned out that they were exchanging SMS in a group. Susan is clearly upset and says this is her only hope, and she doesn't know what she will do if she doesn't have the baby in her arms. Hannah started by saying she would work on me, and her mom simply stated, do it, and ask for forgiveness. He knows that you are much taller than him. Barkley replied, he can't afford a divorce, but Hannah said that we have a prenuptial agreement and that the business is not part of the marital property. Barclay's only response was, about. There was silence in the group for a while, but then Hannah jumped out with a message. He's looking for a divorce lawyer. I checked my email and Tony, the company's lawyer, responded to my email. Oh my God, I thought you were both destined to live together. I would recommend Liam Strong. He will email you a list of his requirements. Of course, a letter arrived from Liam Strong. I opened it and read it. The main part of it contained a brief introduction to him and his practice, followed by a request for information. Deciding that now was the right time, I opened a new document in Word and outlined everything I had learned over the past three months. I also copied messages from the WhatsApp group and sent him a copy of the document that Hannah signed years ago giving the company permission to collect, store, and use her messages. Then he closed the computer, pulled out the sofa bed, 
and went to bed. I woke up to someone trying to open the door to the office. Then I heard a knock and half scream from Hannah. Mark, what are you doing? Why didn't you come to bed? I stood up and looked at my watch. It was 3.30 in the morning. Unlocking and opening the door, I found Hannah standing in the hallway in her robe. It was half open, and it was clear that there was nothing underneath. I looked at her silently. What is the problem? She answered. I was waiting for you in bed. I thought we could at least hug and use the opportunity to talk calmly and figure out how I can reassure you that your jealousy is unfounded. Apparently there were other messages in the group. I didn't want to reveal that I had access, so I left it as is. Instead, I replied, Hannah, over the years of our marriage, you have used sex to get your way on such minor issues as the color of a new car or whether we should get a dog. This is not a small, insignificant issue. You are planning betrayal, and pity sex and pseudoscientific arguments about my male pride and jealousy will not help deal with this. I have no desire to sleep in bed with someone who thinks about cheating on me, and I hope this gives you an idea of what our life will be like if you go through with it. Good night, Hannah. Go to bed and take this opportunity to think about the damage you're doing to our marriage, how you neglect my feelings and self-respect. Jealousy is not the problem. The problem is my ability to look at myself in the mirror. I closed and locked the door. He turned off the light, but remained standing to the side of the door, listening. There was light coming from under the door, and I knew Hannah was still there. I thought I heard a sigh, and then the light went out. The next day was Saturday. I usually leave later on Saturday, but today I left early. I stopped at the cart to buy a bagel for breakfast, then went to the office, put on the coffee, and sat down at my desk to formulate a plan of action. I assumed Hannah would change course. Last night had been her usual tempt him into submission tactic that she used when she wanted something she considered important. Of course I gave in, but it was fun to hold on. I wondered if she understood that this was not just a request for a dog. She could go one of two ways, or she would become very sweet, showing me how good a wife and mother she was and still is, hoping that I would not notice her infidelity. Or she became a hellish bitch, trying to show that if I didn't give in to her, she would turn my life into complete suffering. I assumed today would be the first and then I would take the opposite approach. I stayed in the office until 4.30 after everyone had left. I just couldn't bring myself to go home. I realized that our marriage was like a mirror, and Hannah threw a very big brick at it. The mirror is cracked, and will always be cracked. I began to think our marriage was doomed, no matter what Hannah did next. I dragged myself home at five o'clock. Of course, Hannah was in the kitchen, the sundress hugging her figure. Her makeup was flawless, and her smile was like Helen of Troy. So you could send a thousand ships for her, Normally I would practically attack her in the kitchen, but this time I didn't even pay attention. I went to the spare room to change clothes. About twenty minutes later she shouted up the stairs, Mark, dinner is ready. I had to give the boys a good show, but I wanted to make sure that Hannah understood that this loving wife image of her would not change my decision. When I went to sit down, a glass of red wine was put out for Hannah and me. Then she walked over to the table carrying a plate of T-bone steak, a large portion of French fries, and mushrooms, my favorite Saturday dinner. Nothing surprising. I practically ignored Hannah, talking to the boys about everything she couldn't talk about. She tried to change the subject, but I didn't let her. The boys didn't notice, but she did. After eating, she said, Mark, help me wash the dishes, and the boys will go play a little. I stood up and started to clear the table, but Hannah remained sitting. Hearing that the boys were playing a video game, she said, Mark, sit down and talk to me. What's the matter? I returned to the table and sat down. Then he said, Can you really ask this with a straight face? If you don't know what's going on, then this marriage has even bigger problems than I thought. Let me explain to you. You are planning to cheat on me with the clear intention of getting someone else pregnant. You also know that I'm not buying it, so you put on a loving wife act for me, trying to pretend that if I let you do this, you'll be the best wife and mother a man could ask for. But that won't help, Hannah. If you do this, you will never be a good wife again. 
you will only be a woman to me who cheats. To be clear, I have already contacted a divorce lawyer and will dissolve our marriage if you do so. Her expression changed from a smiling, loving wife to a bitch. Her voice was a half-whisper, but there was still anger in it. She hissed. Let me be clear, I decided to do this for my sister. If you can't deal with this, then divorce me. It sounded like a threat. I think she thought I was bluffing. I took a deep breath and said, Today I sat in the office and thought about what a good marriage is. Marriage is like a mirror, and now you are throwing stones at our mirror. The problem is that our mirror is broken, and no matter how hard we try to put it back together, it will always have cracks. I have a terrible feeling that our marriage now has cracks, and in the end, like a broken mirror, it will collapse. I am not kidding. This is not something I can put up with. You choose them over me and the boys. You have a very short time to show that the most important thing in your life is us. If you don't do this, then, well, there will be nothing left for you and me. I got up from the table and went to the boys' room. We played Call of Duty all night. I had a clear feeling that our family was falling apart, and I was very sad. The next few weeks passed in the same way. Hannah tried her best to be the perfect wife. Every time she tried to talk about the child, I told her the same thing, that this was a reason to break off the relationship. She stopped being so toxic but switched to, trust me, Mark. One evening, Susan came over for dinner. After we finished, Hannah invited me to join them in the corner. Susan started the conversation. Mark, my life will not be complete without a child. I really need him, and what Hannah is willing to do is the greatest gift that can ever be given to me. Can't you open your heart to me? I looked at Hannah to make sure she understood that I could see this ambush coming from a mile away, and then I said, Susan, there are several ways to achieve this. Turning Hannah into a cheater isn't one of them. Now I was looking straight at Susan, but I heard a sharp sign from Hannah and continued, Perhaps life has treated you unfairly, but I am absolutely serious. If you continue down this path, Hannah and I's marriage will be over. Are you willing to sacrifice this for your own personal reason? There are other questions that no one even mentioned. What happens if Barclay can't finish the job the first time? Will it become monthly until she gets pregnant? It took us nine months trying to get pregnant with James and five months with Martin. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Hannah looking away. Obviously, she hoped I didn't think about it. Then I asked, And will one child be enough? Or you will decide that an only child is a single child and declare that you need another one to complete your ideal family? Susan's face turned red, and Hannah started picking at her nails. I looked around and said to Hannah, So you've thought about this too, and you're not going to make it a one-time thing. God, what insidious bitches you are. I have no doubt that you imitate your mother. I stood up, and Susan and Hannah stood up with me. Susan was crying, but Hannah's mask came off again, and she was angry, saying, Mark, I never thought you would be such an intractable bastard. We have given you every opportunity to intelligently resolve this issue, but you refuse. I'm going to Susan and Barclays on Friday evening and will be there for a week. Figure it out. I just said, well, don't bother coming back here. On Friday, you will be served at their home, and your things will be in the garage. I've met Liam Strong six times in the last three weeks. The business and trust fund are securely protected by the prenuptial agreement. The land and house belonged to me before marriage, so all I had to do was share our investments and savings with Hannah. This means that I will give her about $1.5 million, and I have already divided the investment account into two parts. Our state is a no-fault state, but it has laws against unreasonable behavior. The WhatsApp messages and recording of the meeting were enough to show that Hannah was making unreasonable demands. Additionally, the fact that she was hospitalized while pregnant meant that I would most likely get custody of the boys. As I left the kitchen to go to my room, I texted Liam. She goes ahead. They start this Friday. Liam called me, and after a quick hello, he asked, do you know what their plan is? From what I was just told, she will be going to their house on Friday after work and plans to stay there for the weekend and all of next week. Okay, he replied. We have to serve her on Friday when she gets off work. This will give her time to change her mind 
and will look good to the judge. They will want to make sure that she knows your opinion about what she is doing and that she has had enough opportunities to back down. Nothing will tell her what you think better than a divorce petition. Until Thursday evening, the house looked like an ice box. When the boys went to bed, she tried to cuddle with me, but I didn't hug her, even when she tried to lift my hand and put it on her. Finally, she said, Mark, this is just one week of our lives. How can this change anything? I pulled away from her and stood up. Then he said, Hannah, this will change everything. You are leaving me for another man. When you return, you will be an unfaithful wife. I can never touch you without thinking about it. If you really think this is just a week in our lives, then you really ignored me at every stage of the planning. If you go to their house tomorrow, we're done. Hannah looked sad, but did her best to maintain eye contact with me. And I tried to keep eye contact with her. She said, Mark, I'm not leaving you for anyone. All I will do is carry a child for my sister. I took a deep breath. You really don't understand, do you? You're leaving me. You put their desires and interests above mine and the boys. You leave us for a week and you don't care what we do, what I tell the boys, or worse, what happens when their friends find out what you did. And if you don't get pregnant this month, you will do this every month until you get pregnant. Don't shake your head, people will know, because people always found out, etc. This is your last chance to avoid the impending disaster. But I fear that you have turned a blind eye to the needs of this family in order to put the needs of your sister and the desires of your mother first. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. And if you decide to continue, you will at least realize that what happens next inevitably depends on your actions. Hannah sat with her mouth open as I left the room. As I walked up the stairs, I heard her running after me. I went into my room and locked the door. A few seconds after I locked the door, I heard her knock and say, What do you mean when you say what happens next is inevitable? What are you planning? I opened the door. I have already explained this to you. You need to think carefully and decide on your priorities. Then I closed the door again. By 10 o'clock that evening, I was in bed, sleeping more soundly than at any time since this whole mess began. I did everything I could. Further actions depend on her. The next morning, I decided not to leave for work early. While preparing breakfast for the boys, Hannah came into the kitchen with a travel bag. She looked at me with some concern on her face, then turned and put the bag in the laundry room where I couldn't see it. I went back to preparing breakfast for the boys and said, I see that you have made your choice. I heard her go to the closet to get something for herself. I thought you would be gone. I stood with my back to her. I thought we should eat together for the last time, even if it's like this. She stopped moving, but I knew she got my point when she said, What do you mean, eat one last time? These are a couple of mysterious words that you recently said to me. There's nothing mysterious about them, Hannah, I said. I made it clear what will happen if you continue down this path. You simply decided to ignore my extremely clear warnings, so please stop trying to insult my intelligence. She turned to me and I turned to her. For the first time since this confusion began, she realized that I was serious. Concern was written on her face as she said, Now I can't refuse. I'm afraid for Susan's mental health if I do this. I shrugged. Our family has long been the second most important. Then he shouted, Boys, breakfast is ready. I took the keys and said, See you? And walked past her to the door. She grabbed my hand. Didn't even kiss you goodbye? To which I replied, No, thank you. I don't want to take anything away from Barclay. I pulled my hand out of hers before she could move and walk towards the door. When the door closed, I heard her crying. Mark, please, I need you by my side when I do this. I received repeated calls from Hannah and Susan throughout the day. Even Stephanie called, but I didn't answer any of those calls. At four o'clock, the secretary called me and said that John was on the line. I said, connect, and began to wait. Hello, Mark. I know it's a shit show, but it turned into a battle of wills. Hannah thought you would agree but you fought it every step of the way. 
Now she thinks that if she backs down, she will feel like a loser. What can be done to fix this? I took a very deep breath. I'm sorry, John, but there's nothing we can do to fix this. If I let this happen, I'll lose my self-respect. I'll never be able to look at myself in the mirror, and I'll never be able to touch Hannah again. Hannah created this situation herself. If she had thought even a little, she would have understood that I would never allow this to happen in my life. I'll be honest, I think our marriage is irrevocably broken, and your assessment of her unwillingness to back down only confirms this. I'm sorry, John, but either she comes home tonight or it's over between us. After which, he said, Hannah says you said you would divorce her. Is that true? Yes, John, I said. If she continues like this, I will divorce her. The documents have already been prepared, and if she agrees to this, she will be served. It's a no-fouled state, so if I file, I won't back down, and she won't be able to stop it. John took a deep breath and asked, Will you fulfill the marriage contract? I'm glad you remembered because Hannah forgot. Yes, I will. Because I want to protect my business, and the house was mine before marriage. I'll be fair to her, but not overly generous, I said. There was silence for several seconds until John said, I probably would have done the same if I were you. I warned Stephanie not to go down this path, but she said that you were in over your head with Hannah and that you would allow her to do this so as not to lose your social status. I know you much better, and I should have insisted. We ended the conversation by thanking each other. I suspect that the next conversation with John or the rest of the family will not be so friendly. I decided to return home early. The boys will be staying with Mrs. Neal, our neighbor, and I need to get into a new rhythm of life because their lives are about to be turned upside down when the phone rings. It was John again. He simply said, Damn it, Mark. Today she was served with a divorce petition. Yes, John, I told you what I would do. Now she knows how serious I am. Now it's time for her to make a decision. Me and the boys or Susan and Barkley. There was silence on the line for a few seconds. Then John said, She's shocked. Stephanie is ready to tear you apart, and Susan has fallen into such a deep depression that we can't even get through to her. You really turn this family inside out. I answered, I'm sorry, John, but now you know how I've been feeling for the last three weeks. It's not my fault, but I have no choice. Tell Hannah that her actions will give me the answer. If he returns home, we can talk. But if not, then I will understand that I am only in second place. With these words, I hung up. I didn't need John's answer. I drove home, picked up the boys, and ordered pizza for dinner. If Hannah comes home, it will be a war zone. We had already eaten, and I turned on the dishwasher when I heard the sound of a car approaching. I looked out and saw John, Stephanie, and Hannah getting out of the car. I told the boys to go to their rooms and play on the computers, and I went into the room. Now I hated this room because so many bad things had happened in it lately. Stephanie burst through the door first, followed closely by John. Her face showed rage, but John grabbed her. Stephanie, we are here to help, not to make things worse. You should let Mark and Hannah talk. Stephanie spun on her heel. How could things get worse? This simple man is preventing our daughter from giving us grandchildren. I won't put up with this. I saw the look on John's face and suspected that Stephanie, even in full anger, caught the same look and had the good sense to remain silent. Hannah walked behind as if to the gallows. She was holding a brown envelope in her hand. She was crying. That was obvious. She sat down on the three-seater sofa, looking at me, sitting in the only chair. John sat Stephanie down at the kitchen table and then put on the coffee. Hannah looked at me with her red eyes. Is this your last word on this issue? I answered briefly. Yes, Hannah suggested. Is there really no possibility for negotiations? And again, I answered with one word. No. I talked to my sister and mother, but what about IVF? Hannah asked. I was so disgusted with the way I was being treated that I actually felt nauseous at her question, so I wasn't going to feel much compassion for any of them. Hannah, I already said this three weeks ago, but you just wanted to do things your way. I don't think I can trust you not to sneak out and cheat on me behind my back. So, it's too little, too late. 
You can donate your eggs and hire a surrogate mother. I'll even pay for it. But you treated me so disrespectfully that I will not agree for you to bear the child. I saw Stephanie start to seethe again, but John put his hand on her shoulder. Stephanie, you shouldn't get involved in this. We ourselves are to blame. Hannah and Mark have to figure it out on their own. Hannah cried quietly. I didn't want to be the bad guy in this situation, but it was clear that everyone was going to make me out to be one. Hannah raised her head. I don't want to get a divorce. I need you. How can we fix everything? I took a deep breath. To be honest, so much water has already flowed under this bridge that I don't know if we can. But let's try. The first thing to do is to put an end to this entire proposal. Your decision to exclude me from the discussion and subsequent proposal is unacceptable. If you want to continue acting as Susan's surrogate, I will continue with the divorce. Next, we need to rebuild our marriage. I gave you the opportunity to be yourself, but you seem to take that to mean that I would agree with whatever you did. A wife who respects her husband as an equal would never offer what you offer. A wife who understands how much her husband puts into his marriage vows would never even think that this is acceptable. So, we need to think about how to fix a broken mirror. Using the phrase broken mirror made her jump. You said this before. He said that a broken mirror can be repaired, but the crack will always be visible in it. Will our marriage really be like this? I looked into her eyes and said, I'm afraid so. By this point, Stephanie was beside herself with outrage. She stated, what about poor Susan? You're depriving her of her only hope for a child. Without taking my eyes off Hannah, I said, Hannah, you can collect your eggs. At the clinic, they will be fertilized with Barclay's sperm in a test tube and implanted into a surrogate mother. They have such a service. But Hannah, as soon as your eggs are collected, I expect you to have your tubes tied. A few years ago, we decided we weren't going to have any more children. But Hannah said she didn't want to be sterilized. She said that her periods make her feel special. She took pills to prevent accidents. When I mentioned two-ball legation, she turned pale. Please don't make me do this. I just shook my head. You really don't understand what's going on. You were ready to play games with your body. The only way I can guarantee you won't do this again is by taking your body out of the equation. This means making sure you can't get pregnant the good old-fashioned way. Sorry, Hannah, but when you play with fire, you can get burned. I don't know if Hannah was devastated or furious. She was crying when Stephanie spoke again. You really are heartless. I turned and said, I learned from the best, Stephanie. Hannah agreed to sterilization if I stopped the divorce. We agreed that I would put the divorce on hold and end it the day she went to the hospital for sterilization. A month later, we were sitting in the IVF clinic. The clinic helped Sarah and Barclay find a surrogate mother, and John and I paid her $10,000 each. The egg retrieval procedure was simple, but left Hannah in some minor pain. A week later, Hannah went to the hospital to be sterilized, and I went to the judge to withdraw the divorce petition, which he granted without question. Life continued seemingly normally, but our once very active sex life faded away, and we regularly sat in separate chairs in the evenings watching TV, with nothing to say to each other. The surrogate mother was given two viable eggs about a month after the retrieval. Unfortunately, she suffered a miscarriage in the third month. No other eggs were viable, and Hannah could no longer provide them. Hannah stopped hosting family events at our house, and I happily avoided events in other places. It doesn't take a genius to realize that we are actually two people raising children who have a piece of paper saying we are married, but no real relationship. Everything I predicted came true. Hannah proposed a hopeless situation, and such an outcome was inevitable. The loser, Hannah, could not stand the winner, me. This went on for ten years. We did everything for the sake of the children. Sports, events, parent committee. No matter what, I was there and Hannah was always by my side. All our parents were jealous of us. But at home we had a different life. Of course he... We shared a bed, but there was no intimacy. We had sex, and over time, the frequency of this sex increased, even reaching two or three times a week, but there was no love in it. Both made sure that the other got pleasure, but they always slept with their backs to each other. 
Martin started his own business at the age of 16, creating apps that he sold in various app stores. Things were going well for him when one day a large company from San Jose came into town and offered him a seven-figure sum to buy his business and also work at their enterprise with a six-figure salary per year. He was 20 years old, and he jumped at the offer. He and I drove to San Jose to look at the location, and he rented a house in a gated community just off the freeway. James was 22 years old and had just married his college sweetheart. Both were accountants and worked for John. They rented a small house, but real estate prices in our city had risen sharply, and so far they could not afford to buy. I set up a trust fund to buy them a house. Hannah and I had become empty nesters, and it was clear that neither of us wanted to say anything to each other. Two weeks after James's wedding, Hannah asked me to come home early. I arrived and saw her sitting in the kitchen with a suitcase in her hands. She cried, but then she began, Mark, I think we both knew this was coming. From that day, in this room ten years ago, we ceased to be husband and wife. We were ships passing in the night, with some advantages. I think it's time to admit that our marriage is broken, and, like a mirror, no matter how hard we try to avoid it, the cracks are too big to ignore. I filed for divorce, and under exactly the same conditions as you. I guess you don't need me to get things done properly. My lawyer's details are on the envelope. Maybe we can make everything as simple and friendly as possible. I had to agree with her. When I applied ten years ago, I divided everything. She had her own checking account, her own investment account, her own retirement account, and her own credit cards. I had the same thing. This divorce has been in the making for ten years. But it is impossible to stop a catastrophe once it has already begun. And it very much began in this room ten years ago. I nodded. I think it's for the best. I won't delay. Let me know who to contact so we can wrap things up as quickly as possible. Hannah stood up and kissed me on the cheek, the first affection we had shown each other in a long time. She said, I packed my things for the week. I'm going to rent one of the apartments on the same block as James's apartment. I'll let you know when I'm there and get someone to take my things out. Do you mind if I take some of the furniture? Yes, just leave me a couple of chairs and a bed. At this, she laughed. I doubt most of this will fit in my new apartment. Then she said, See you, Mark, and left the house for the last time. I was a little sad, but the main feeling was relief. We haven't been a couple for a long time, and this led to the end of the relationship. I contacted Liam, and he agreed to work for me again. The judge wanted us to go to counseling, but we both said the marriage wasn't worth saving, so he granted the petition and the divorce was finalized in 90 days on exactly the terms Hannah proposed. Shortly before the divorce, James announced that they were expecting a new baby. The problem was that he hardly came to see me, so I made some important decisions. The first thing is to sell your business. I had just put it up for sale when one of my biggest competitors came and offered $30 million to take it. I agreed with pleasure, the business was not worth that amount to anyone but them, after which I gave James the house and moved to a small town in Napa Valley. The town was so small that there was not a single auto mechanic in it, so I opened my own business. This time it was small, only I worked in the workshop and at the hours that I needed. Even better, Martin could now work most of his time remotely, so he came to live with me in my new home, working from the office we set up in the basement. I went back and forth to our hometown. James was still a little upset about the divorce, but he wanted me to be involved in baby Jane's life. I liked visiting her. About two years after she was born, I met Hannah at the house. She was dating a doctor who was one of her clients. I was happy for her. Soon after, I found myself at a networking event in my new city where my accountant invited me. At the event, I met Ruby, a 30-something web designer. The next night, the networking group was having a drinks party, and as we were leaving, Ruby said, I hope you'll be at the party. I looked at her and realized she was grinning cheekily as she said this. I smiled and asked, Okay, is it fun there? Without wasting any time, she replied, This time it will be, I promise. Ruby was 20 years younger than me, but she consumed me that night. We never got married, but after that night I never lacked company. 
After her miscarriage, Susan was devastated. She started going to counseling, then quit her job and went back to college to become a teacher of special needs children. After graduating from college, she began working at a local school as a teacher in a classroom for children with special educational needs. She found the love she needed in this class. Her depression lifted and she began to think that not having children was the best thing that had happened to her. Barkley has turned into an old goat. Susan caught him trying to impregnate a surrogate mother the good old-fashioned way. And he succeeded. He married her and they eventually had three children. Then he caught her cheating. During the divorce, it turned out that the first child was his, and the two younger children had different fathers. Since he was indicated on the child's birth certificate, and the biological fathers could not be found, alimony payments began to be withheld from him. Now he lives in a rather disadvantaged area of the city, where most of his clients came from. His ex-wife basically turned the kids against him, and he doesn't see them. I have a feeling he regrets ever having kids. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.